Welcome once again to the 40 days of community. This is a season when we are uh, seeking to strengthen the love among us uh, as a fellowship, but also to share that love with other people. And this week, we are looking at growing together. Growing together. Now, think about plants. Uh, plants grow. Plants need water. Plants need to put their roots into uh, the ground. And so uh, that's why we are looking at growing together. And in the Christian walk, uh, we talk about um, growing uh, as the Lord feeds us with his word. And, and as we uh, share with one another, we grow. But God doesn't want us to just grow alone. He wants us to grow together. Today, I'd like to look at three areas that are required in order for us to grow together. The first one is that growing together requires patience. Growing together requires patience. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 5 says, Love is patient. It is not rude. It is not easily angered. So growing together, my friends, requires patience. Patience. Why does it require patience? It's because you and I are actually wired quite differently. Some of the things I like are not the things that resonate with you. But because God wants us to grow together, it means that I need to be patient with you, and you need to be patient with me, and we need to be patient with one another. That way, we learn a lot from one another. In fact, in the King James Version, uh, that word, patience, is described as long-suffering. <laughs> it's like, you, you suffer long on my behalf. I keep stepping on your toes, but you are patient with me. You endure, you are doing long-suffering, suffering for a long time. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says, Be humble and gentle in every way. Be patient with each other and lovingly accept each other. When I come to the fellowship, I come with a whole package of myself. I come myself, my background, the way I, was, I grew, and you come with your own background, the lessons you have learned over life. And because your path may have been different from my path, when we come together, there's a big likelihood that there are certain things that will not resonate well one with another. But you know, God has brought us together with that diversity so that we can enrich each other's experience. So growing together requires patience. The second requirement for growing together is truthfulness. So growing together requires truthfulness, telling the truth. Sometimes we talk about speaking truth to power, speaking truth to one another. Because you see, in life, many people don't really tell each other the truth because they don't want to annoy each other. They avoid conflict by not speaking the truth to each other. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, uh, the, the first part says, Love rejoices in the truth. You'd rather tell me the real truth than hide the truth from me than I discover it later. Strong relationships require that we tell the truth to each other. That truth is not always pleasant, sometimes it's bitter. But if I can learn from the bitter truth that you tell me, then I will grow uh, more together with you. Growing together requires that we sharpen each other. Sometimes we graft each other. You cut off some of my rugged edges and it is it's painful. I cut off some of your rugged edges and it's painful. But at the end of the day, we will be more fruitful together because we sharpened each other. You have heard it say that iron sharpens iron. Now, when iron is sharpening another piece of iron, there is friction. Sometimes there are sparks. We feel a little pain, but at the end of the day, 
we are stronger and better and sharper and more productive uh, together. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, Speak the truth in a spirit of love. What that means is that if you need to rebuke me, and sometimes you need to do that, and I need to rebuke you because of some tendencies that I see in you, and because I want a better brother and a better sister, I will need to confront you, you need to confront me. But what is a spirit in which you confront me? It needs to be in a spirit of love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Speaking the truth in love means that I need to check certain things. What is my attitude as I talk to you uh, in love? And one of those is we need to check our motives. Check your motives. What is the motive in which I am rebuking you or challenging you or advising you? It has to be loving motive. Check your motives. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 to 5, the Bible says, Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? First, get rid of the log in your own eye, then perhaps you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. In other words, when I come to you to correct you, and when you come to me to correct me, have an attitude that you are not the angel here. No, you are like a blind person uh, trying to help another one see the light which you have seen. You don't come as, as, as the wisest, you come as a beggar that is helping the other beggar find some food. The right motive will win your brother. The right motive will, with, will win your sister. Secondly, on this, plan your presentation. How will you confront your brother who has done something wrong? Plan it well. Make sure that your words are well organized. Plan the right time. In fact, I'm reminded of Nehemiah when he was going to see the king so that he can be uh, given the resources to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he chose his presentation during a time when there was a meal. He was serving the meal to the king. Then he also chose a time when the king's wife would also be uh, there. And so she was able to hear that and would echo, I'm sure, support what the king would be listening to. So make sure that your presentation is well uh, planned. Plan when to say what. What, when, what time is best for you to confront me. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11, the Bible says, the right word at the right time the right word at the right time is like precious gold set in silver. Listen to that. The right word at the right time is like precious gold set in silver. That is a precautionary statement. You may have the right words, but say them at the wrong time. The reception will not be well, uh, will not be very effective. You may have the right things, but when you say them at the wrong time, if you rebuke me in the presence of my children, I will say, you have the right thing, but the right, the wrong time. And I will defend myself. And so as we deal with each other, choose, uh, plan your presentation, plan when you will say it, but also plan what you will say, exactly what will you say to your brother or to your sister who has done something wrong? Hear the wisdom of uh, Solomon in Proverbs chapter 25, verse number 12. This is what uh, the Bible says. A wise friend's kind reprimand is like a gold ring slipped on your finger. Now, those of you who have ever given someone a ring for whatever reason, you know the joy that comes with a ring. If somebody gives you a ring, you are happy. And what the scriptures are saying is that a wise friend's kind reprimand or the wisdom 
um, uh, or the correction of a wise person to their friend is compared to that beauty and that joy of giving someone a ring. In other words, here is wisdom on how you need to present uh, your reprimand uh, to a brother so that you can grow together. You are correcting the other person so that you can grow in the faith together. But that's not all. Plan how you will say it. How exactly will you choose your words? Will you sing a song? Will you come with a poem like the one? Uh, you remember Prophet Nathan when he went to rebuke David? David had sinned uh, with Bathsheba. He had killed Uriah. And, um, and uh, there was a way in which uh, Prophet Nathan went to bring the information to the king. It had to be well shaped, correctly chosen. Words coming through in a way that does not threaten, and yet the truth is able to penetrate uh, through the defenses of the person you are talking to. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, again says, Thoughtless words wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. In other words, if you uh, confront someone and use unwise words, you can actually destroy that person. That person may never again come to the, uh, to the fellowship. But if you choose your words well and craft them well and choose the place and, and, and think through uh, well about it, you will save the person. But that's not all. We are encouraged to pray. So Pray before you correct a brother. Pray before you share a reprimand with a sister. Because when you pray, you not only prepare yourself by your prayer, but you also prepare the other person because God answers prayers. When we pray, we will go uh, peacefully. Our attitudes will be correct. Our motives will be clear. And we are able to save people because we shared uh, with wisdom. And then say it tactively. Say it tactively. Say it with tact. In other words, do it with selected words. Do it carefully. Don't portray a feeling of arrogance. No, choose your words well with tact. Proverbs chapter 16, again, verse number 21 says, a wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. Pleasant words can penetrate the defenses of the most difficult person. But if you don't choose your words well, even your best intentions will be misunderstood. But if you choose your words well, you will win your brother or your sister. And then... How do you say it? Say it lovingly. In other words, don't go with a fight. Don't go with a club. Don't go to say, I will use this truth. This person has done something wrong. I will use it like a gun. I will shoot them. I will show them what, where, where they belong. I will put them down. No. Do it in a loving manner. When you rebuke a brother in love, they will take it. When you rebuke a sister out with, with no love and you didn't organize your presentation, they will reject it and they will not grow. And finally, say it gently. Say it gently. Now this has to do with your disposition. Are you shouting at the person you are talking to? Have you raised your voice or have you lowered your voice in a wise way? Have you shouted at this person and, and therefore when you shout, you make them uh, uh, defend themselves? Or have you whispered in love? There are some words in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. This is what the Bible says. If someone is trapped in sin, you should gently, gently lead that person back to the right path. Gently, not in a shouting match. No, gently. If someone has sinned, gently correct them. Here again, words from Proverbs 15, verse number 1. A soft answer turns away wrath. Hear that. A soft answer turns away wrath. 
You know, there are different ways in which we can talk to people. We can tell them, for instance, we want to uh, portray passion. We can say, I love you. Or you can say, I love you. What's wrong with you? I love you. Or you can say, I love you. Now, those two statements are the same, but they are said in very different ways. And that is uh, what we are being taught to learn on how to portray, to correct one another gently. Proverbs 24, again, verse number 26 says, An honest answer, an honest answer is a sign of true friendship. An honest answer is a sign of true friendship. The third way in which we can grow together as a requirement is this. Growing together requires forgiveness. Forgiveness. I can say it again, even to myself. Forgiveness. Do we need to forgive each other? Yes. Seven times? No. Seven times 70. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 says, Love keeps no record of wrongs. My friends, if you were to count the number of times that people have wronged you, you will feel a whole book. If I were to count and keep a record, and if God was to keep a record of the many times I have not done the right thing, even this whole world will feel my wrongs. Now, the Bible teaches us not to keep this chronology of wrongs that we keep reciting to each other. You did this yesterday. You did this last year. 20 years ago, you did this. No. If God were to do that for us, we would never be saved. But God has forgiven us. In fact, it says, while we were yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for our sins. We can only grow together if we learn to constantly forgive each other. When we forgive each other constantly, when we don't keep records of each other's wrongs, then we can grow together as a united people who love one another. Not because we don't hurt each other, no, but because we have learned to forgive our hearts when we hurt each other. Matthew chapter 7 verse number 2 says, In the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Can you imagine that the way you judge others, that's the same way that God would judge you? That's why in the, in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord taught us to say, Forgive our sins just as we do what? As we forgive other people. Therefore, if we do not forgive other people, we have no right to ask the Lord to forgive us. May the Lord help us. So today, we have learned three things about growing together. And growing together is about deepening our roots, deepening uh, our roots uh, in the Word of God. Three ways growing together requires Patience, growing together requires truthfulness, and growing together requires forgiveness. May God help you, my brother and my sister, and help you in your small group, in our church, in our ministries, to learn to grow together by forgiving and loving one another. Let's pray again together. Sovereign Lord, we thank you. Because you do not want us to grow alone. You want us to support each other as we grow in the faith. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to forgive us, to help us love one another, know one another deeply, and consider each other as friends. And when we hurt each other, to also forgive each other. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And may God bless you.